be so much more powerful than I realize sometimes. Because we're so busy magnifying what's going on in our lives. We're so busy seeing what we see in front of us in the natural. And so, it's so it's so easy to miss to miss who he is and miss what he's capable of. Because there is no limitation and there is no boundary to what he can do. And in, in our American culture, I find that we struggle the most with healing. I find we struggle the most with dealing with a situation where a miracle is required. Yep. But for some strange reason, when people leave the borders and the perimeters of this country and they go into other countries, there seems to be a faith that's just very different. There seems to be a moving of the Spirit just in a different way, in a, in a different capacity. The same Spirit, the same power that comes from God. But the faith that's there, it's just different. And people see lots of miracles and healings and things of that nature that it seems to be less common here. But one thing's for sure, when a person gets saved, that's a miracle. When someone comes to Christ, when a, when a person's complete and total self, their whole demeanor, their whole person has been changed, when that old man dies and the new man comes to life, there is a miracle that has taken place. There's no doubt about it. It was just a message that's been on my heart and it's been evolving for quite some time now and I know I've shared bits and pieces of it to different people and friends around me because that's just what I do when God's burning something in my heart, I do. I, I talk about it all the time and uh, the title of the message tonight is Wasted Wages. It's Wasted Wages. <laughs> Romans 6, I just had to do it, I couldn't resist, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 6 is where we're going to be at. That's the uh, theme, the theme chapter, and we're going to start, we're going to start in verse 20. Try to keep up, man, okay? I'm not going fast tonight like I, like I usually do, so it'll be okay. You keep up quite well anyway. I think you've already proven that. Romans 6, verse 20. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, I love it when, when there's a scripture that's going like that and then you see but. He says, but now, being made free from sin and become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But, for the wages of sin is death. But, thank God that regardless of the fact that the wages of sin is death, that there is a but. Amen. And that it says, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Wasted wages. The wasted wages of sin is, is what I'm talking about tonight. And I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit more on the earthly thing, side of it, on the natural side of it, because it kind of helps to, to make the point. People are spending all their time wasting wages without realizing that that's what they're doing. There's a lot of people that are doing it. A lot of people in Christ. A lot of people in Christ because of what what's talked about a lot from this pulpit that people just don't understand the process. They don't understand what's going on. I don't understand the whole process to the T, to the very nitty gritty, every mechanical nut and bolt to the process of the gospel of Christ. But the little bit that I do understand, I, I want to talk about that tonight. And people spending their time doing this, but more in the earthly and in the natural, people are okay with spending their wages. I'm talking about money. I'm talking about the green and white stuff. People are okay with spending it, but everyone hates wasting their money. Everyone hates wasting their wages. There's nothing, I can't think of very many things I hate more than wasting my money. Then when I bought something, I got that something in my hand and I found out that that was a sorry low down piece of garbage that I paid my hard earned money for and now I'm stuck with it or am I because I'll be finding my way back to the store that I bought it from 
I'll be shipping that bad boy back to Amazon where I bought it from. <laughs> and you can believe I've done it quite a few times. But have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like you were just throwing your money away when you purchased something and you saw what you got? It didn't perform the way it was supposed to perform. You ever feel like that? I feel like that quite often. How about in other realms? How about needless doctor visits? Going to the doctor for just a little sniffle or a cold, the kids complaining. Bring them to the doctor. Come to find out it was nothing, nothing of any great magnitude. You could have just stayed home. You could have gone to the store. You could have treated it yourself. Not buying the warranty on something. That used to be me on a lot of things. There's certain things I still won't buy the warranty. To save money, if I feel like I can fix it, if I feel like I can handle it, I won't buy the warranty. But there was some times when I didn't buy the warranty and I was so sorry that I didn't buy the warranty. I saved money on the warranty. I wasted money on the product. I should have bought the warranty. Groceries that your child never ate. Ever did that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I want that. Ooh, I want that. I want that. This is not something that I just made up. My daughter, when she was coming over to my house to spend more time with me, you know, when she was much younger and didn't have such a busy life in college and her own job, I asked her when we were at the grocery store, I said, what cereal do you really like? And I'll buy that cereal. She says, Fruity Pebbles. So I bought Fruity Pebbles. I put it in my fridge. I just had a sneaky feeling. I'm going to tell you what, it was there for years. <laughs> years. I am not kidding you. It was there for years. And finally, I said, you know what? If this is going to get done, I'm going to have to be the man for this job. And so I wiped it out. I wiped it out in less than a week. I took care of it. So groceries that your child never ate, it really gets home for me. Grocery shopping when you're hungry. Has that ever happened to you? How much money have you wasted doing that? The toy or the toys that that, that kid just never played with. How much money have you wasted on a toy like that? Or the one that they just touched the first time they opened the gift, they played with it that one time, threw it to the side in the corner, and they went back to the one toy that they really, really liked. How about leaving the air conditioner on when no one's home? Mm. Leaving the lights on when no one's home? Going on vacation, and you done left the AC on, you done left the lights on. How about forgetting to return something within the 90-day store policy? As if 91 days would make a difference. Kind of makes you feel that way sometimes. Going to the ATM, all you needed was $20. All you needed was $20 cash. But I've learned something. To get that extra cash just in case, if you take out $20 at the ATM, you'll spend $20. If you take out $40, you're going to spend $40. You get that extra $20, you'll end up spending it. Most of you probably would. I know I would. There's a lot of different ways that we waste money. How about brushing your teeth like you clean your barbecue pit with a wire brush? <laughs> Later on in life, it's going to come back. It will return to you, and you'll realize that that was a waste of a toothbrush. <laughs> that was a waste of a technique of using a toothbrush. I don't know why I know anything about that. <laughs> How about rushing? trying to hurry up, get yourself ready so you can get to work in a hurry. You breeze right by the coffee machine, jump in your vehicle, rush so you can get to the new local coffee shop and get you a grande, half-calf, double mocha vanilla, chai peppermint cream coffee. How much money did you just waste there when you get to save pennies and just start the dog on coffee machine when you, as soon as you get up and brew you some coffee? <laughs> Being late on paying your bills, paying the late fees. Movie rental returns. You see a friend say, hey, Magis, I got this good movie I just watched. It doesn't have to be returned till tomorrow. You give it to them. Come to find out months later, they didn't return it. <laughs> when you get the bill in the mail. How about getting a vegetable that you just knew you was going to eat? You threw it in the, the crisper drawer in the refrigerator and you end up finding out you're just throwing cash in the trash. When you open up the refrigerator one day, you open that drawer to get something else and this stench just comes right out of that drawer and just slaps you in the face and you realize that it's still there. How about an oil change? Go to your local lube oil change place or you go to your auto dealer to get your oil change and uh, you knew your brakes were a little bad, but I mean, all four brake pads, really? <laughs> they all wear the same at the same time? Somebody got you. 
Yep. How about the credit card, not paying it off monthly? How about a monthly gym membership? You go to the gym about once a month, you have to pay the bill once a month. That's not how the deal works. You have to pay the bill once a month, but you can go every day if you want. Yeah, right. It's not necessary just to go once a month. How about couponing? Couponing just because. You buy the product that you really don't normally use, but it looks like a great deal. <laughs> or you get something comparable and it costs $10, but with a coupon you save a dollar, but you can get it for $6 and a different brand that's just as good. Are you really saving money? You're wasting money. Wasted wages. Any payment for anything, this is my first point, any payment for anything that does not work is wasted wages. Anything. Any payment for anything that does not work is wasted wages. It's nothing more than wasted wages. I cannot stand when I buy cheap junk. I did that recently. I had bought some cheap junk. I had bought this one tool that I, I, I had one that worked and I just figured when I, I wanted this type. And so when I bought it and I went home and the time came and I was gonna use it, I pull it out, I go to my truck, I go and, and squat down, get down by the tire, I hold the gauge in one hand, take the hose and put it down on the, the valve stem and as soon as I put pressure to it, whoop, it fly, the end of it flies off and just barely misses my head. It's nothing more frustrating to me. <laughs> Nothing more frustrating to me than when I buy something. I think I've got a great deal. I go to use it and it does not work. You know I brought it back. It was less than $5, but I was bringing it back. There's a principle at work there, okay? Understand something. It makes people feel like they've been ripped off when they buy something and it doesn't work or it doesn't work to the proper performance. Satan wants to make a fool out of us. He wants to make a fool out of us, and he wants us to feel like what he's offering us works. He wants to make us feel like that fulfillment and that self-satisfaction can actually do something for us, can actually offer something of, of lasting, lasting favor. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, Paul says, and I'm kind of starting at the, toward the end of verse 10. It says, For your sakes I forgave it in person, in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. And that's what the devil wants to do with these wages of sin, is he wants to take advantage of us. He wants to bring us to a place to where he has absolute total dominion, has absolute total control, over us. I was watching an interview recently with uh, Judge Judy. Everybody knows who Judge Judy is, I'm sure. Man, I'm going to tell you what, that lady has some wisdom. And when she said this, I was like, God, it's just like the devil. She said, well, the, the guy who was interviewing her said, he asked her, he said, Judge, he said, uh, you know, I really wonder, I've always wondered this, does anybody ever, like, you know, outside of the courtroom, on the street, in, in the busyness of life or whatever, at the grocery store, or just wherever, does anybody ever, has anybody ever tried to take advantage of you? And she said, hmm. She said, what do you think? She said, but I'll tell you this. She said, when someone tries to take advantage of you, in essence, they're saying you're a fool. They wouldn't try to take advantage of you if they didn't think that they could possibly make a fool out of you. And when she said that, I was like, man, that is it. That is it. That is the devil to the T. That is what he really thinks about us. He knows that he is smart. He knows, and I know a lot of people knock on him because of what he did in the beginning, because of what we know about how he fell from, he was cast out of heaven. And, and I, I understand, and I get that, and it's true. He was a fool for doing that. He was a fool for even thinking he could get away with it. But he is smart, and he does have tactics, and, and he knows how to get over on people. And that's what the devil wants to do, is he wants to make fools out of us. He wants to make us feel, and wants to make us the butt of his joke. Concerning man's spiritual and eternal future, there are only two ways that this thing can work out. Either you get what you paid for, or you get what he paid for. Either you're living a life on a road 
to an inevitable eternal death or you're living a life on a road to an inter inevitable eternal life. Romans 6, 20, we had just read it. In that verse, he says, for when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. When you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Not a good thing. That's an interesting concept. It's not a good thing. Not at all. So there's no restraint by God in a man's or a woman's life when they're free. When they're free from righteousness. When they're a servant to sin, there is no restraint within yourself. There is no real pull, no real necessary, necessary uh, tug of war going on. Not at that point in a person's life. The person's spiritually dead. They're not bound by any moral obligation. Romans 6, 21 to the next verse. What fruit did you have in the things that you have that have only shamed you? What he's saying is, how was that working out for you back then? See, he's talking to believers. I know you know this. You've heard it so many times. The, most of the epistles, most of the books in the New Testament, they were written, most of them, to, to believers, to save people. Okay? But there's a point here. He's, he's talking to them about not going back. He's talking to them about their current state. And then apparently there were some who were going back. They were reverting back to that old life. They were reverting back to that old nature, that old man. And he's saying, how was that working for you back then? Just think about it. Look back to the way things were. That wasn't working. Look at the fruit you had back there. Look at what was happening. No good. It was garbage. It's cheap junk. It's cheap junk that you bought with the wages of your life, your sin, and it's leading on a road that can only end in one place. Yeah. Shame and guilt is a sign. Shame and guilt is a sign. And the devil will jump all over that when it's happening in your life. He'll jump all over. He'll dance all over it. And he'll just make you feel it. He'll drive it down as deep as he possibly can on the inside of you. And what shame and guilt is, like I said, it's a sign. It signals out to the individual that there's an eternity of shame waiting for you if you stay on that road. There is no way out of eternity. There is no way to pry out, to get yourself out. Once you're there, you're there. The magnetic pull of sin and temptation that pulls a person into that thing is the same magnetic pull that I believe is right there in hell. It, 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 has, it grips you, it pulls you, it holds you. There's no way out. I did hear a story. It was an interesting story by a minister who uh, his grandfather pastored a church. And in that church... Uh, they had a guy that was a, a regular attendee, but he wasn't the 100% regular. And when he would go, he would normally show up uh, on time <laughs> and he would uh, enjoy the praise and worship. And when the preaching of the word came forth, he was, he was out of it. And so he ended up dying. And while he was in the hospital bedroom, he died and they brought him back. And so when he came back, he tells the story that he actually traveled when he died. He went through a tunnel, a very fast moving tunnel. He said it was moving so fast. He said it was, it must have been something like the speed of light. It was insane. It was just insane how fast it was. And he said, it got to a point where I was at the end of the tunnel and then just bam, I'm standing on my feet. And there's just 100% absolute darkness all around me. And I'm like, oh my God, he said, something's wrong. I, I thought I was supposed to be in heaven and I was going down for one thing. And he said, now I'm in darkness. So he's really, really getting scared. He's really getting fearful. And then all of a sudden he starts to see these faces pop up all around him, faces all around him. And he saw faces, Asian faces. He saw black faces. He saw white faces. He saw red faces. I mean, he saw people represented nationalities from all over the world. And he said there was just thousands and thousands of them just popping. He said apparently they were traveling through a tunnel too. And when they, you know, they started popping up. And he said then all of a sudden we saw this 
big, huge, beautiful angel appear. And he started to greet everyone and say, welcome, welcome to your joy. Welcome to your peace. He said, you're finally here. He said, come, come with me. Come on, follow me. And he turns around and he starts to walk away. And as he walks away, they start to follow him, just blindly going behind him. And as they start to follow him, they start to feel like a magnetic pull that's pulling on him. And so there was no real reason to worry until he turned back around. And when he turned back around, his whole face had changed. And he started laughing with this most hideous laugh. It was the most ugly, most disgusting, vile creature that he said he had ever seen in his life. Yeah. And he was just laughing and laughing at him. And when he stopped, they just kept moving forward. And some of them were fighting and trying not to go forward, but there was nothing they could do. It's just one man's experience. It's his story. He came back to tell the story. I've heard that more than once about traveling through a tunnel. There was another uh, minister named Paul Hughes who came to a church that I used to attend and, and he was sharing his testimony. He was a Vietnam veteran who had died and traveled through a tunnel and went to hell also. So, uh, I don't know. There's something there. It's really interesting though. Uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter 4 verses 3 through 7. I know you've read this story many, many times in this church. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of, the, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. And of that fat thereof, of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and unto his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, he was angry. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you wroth? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And some translations actually translate the sin offering. So there is a little bit of debate about what that really means. And unto thee will be his desire and you shall rule over him. And so I'm not going to really spend too much on that sin, sin offering thing, um, but, but it's, it's really significant. And uh, I actually had talked to Matt about it to get his uh, take on it. And uh, the more we discussed it and talked about it, we were just wondering, just wondering if maybe it has a dual meaning. Maybe sin is there and then there is a sin offering there. The fact of the matter is whatever it means, I know that there's always a way of escape while we're here in this life. When we sin and when we do make the wrong choice, when we make the wrong decision. And in Cain's situation, uh, I'm not judging that scripture and judging him in that scripture to say that he sinned. But he definitely offered the wrong kind of sacrifice. He definitely offered something that was not acceptable. We cannot bring something unacceptable to a God who only accepts that one thing. We have to know what it is that he expects. And we have to bring something that's acceptable to him. And when God reprimanded him, look at his attitude. Look at the way he responds. And the only way I look at that is, hello, Mr. Me. Hello, Mr. Me. He's in charge. Cain's like, oh, it's me. This is what I brought. This is what I had. This is what I brought. You didn't accept it. And God's saying, the way God corrects him, it seems to me, it, it gives the indication to me that God had already explained this. Look at what he says. Why are you angry? Why are you wroth? And why is your countenance falling? Why is your demeanor down? Why are you so depressed? Why are you so discouraged? If you would have done well, if you would have done right, what do you think would have happened? But you did it this way, and what were you expecting to happen there? See, I, he explained it. When Adam and Eve sinned, and when a sacrifice was provided to them, and they were clothed with the skins of the animals, it had to have been explained. They knew they had done wrong. He went through all that. We see that in Scripture. And so at some point, the sacrifice issue had to have been explained. And they had to know, this is what God accepts. This is what He's looking for. When you do sin, when you do need a sacrifice, this is what is necessary. 
But Mr. Me got in the way, and Cain took it a step further. Sin was at the door, and a sin offering was also at the door. If he didn't know how to get a good sacrifice, he had his brother there. He had his brother there to help him with that. But instead of finding help from his brother, he went and <coughs> delayed him. What Cain did was he brought something unacceptable to God who only accepts a certain kind of thing. It's like taking an antique key, one of those big, huge keys to those old doors that used to be on houses back from 70 to 100 years or more ago and trying to put it in a modern day lock. It's not going to work. Cain may as well have built an altar to himself that day. And at his altar, was the, it was the altar that was built to pride and unbelief. God already had explained what was to be done. And he flat out didn't believe it. And he had the audacity to go to God with that garbage, with that cheap junk, and think that something was going to be different. And think that something was going to give. Something gave all right. God gave him something. It wasn't the fire that was going to consume a good, beautiful sacrifice. It was the fire of conviction. See, we know what we have to do. I know in this church, and I know I, I recognize every face in this church, we know what's required. We know. And so what's always encroaching on us and what's always there pleading with us on the wrong side of this is, is the desire to go back, is the desire just to take one more taste, one more time in the old life. And that's what Cain represents. That's who he represents. He implied that God already... Ex it was implied, yes. Verse 7, he says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not well, a sin or a sin offering lies at the door. Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So that's the way I was looking at it in one side of it, the sin offering lying at the door. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. There's always a way out. There's always. But the problem is when, you, when, when I'm already running to that thing, when I'm already running to that wrong thing, it's very difficult for me to hear him knocking on the door. It's very, very, when I'm already in the pool, the magnetic pool of sin, when I'm already being pulled, I'm only being pulled because I turned to it. I'm only being pulled because I put myself in a place where I could be pulled. The price of eternal death, the price that we would pay for our own sin is a hefty price and it's not a good deal and we cannot afford it. You better find your sin out before your sin finds you out. That's my second point. You better find your sin out before your sin finds you out. And I see a connection in this with verse 22 of Romans 6. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We can find it out at the cross. If we need to find our sin out, if we need to get it out, we can find it at the cross or it will find us out and it will take us out to our own ruin. That's where it leads if we give to it. That's where it leads. If we turn to it and we face up, we square up to it and we look at it and we admire it, eventually it reaches out like a viper snake and it bites us. It snaps. Romans 3.22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Bef the couple of verses before that, he was talking about what fruit did you have and the things that have only shamed you. And here he's talking about another fruit. This is the fruit where there is no shame. This is the fruit where there is no guilt. This is the fruit that overcomes shame and guilt. This is the fruit that has an end, just like the other fruit has an end. But this fruit has everlasting life at the end. Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. 
The wasted wages of sin is death. Either side of the cross. It doesn't matter what side of the cross you're on. You can be on the saved side of, cross, of the cross. You can be on the side of the cross of someone who knows the truth. You know the gospel. You're walking in it. The wages of your sin as a saved person is still death. It doesn't matter. Just because I'm saved doesn't mean that my sin does not have repercussions. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have consequences. On any day of the week, it could be Monday or it could be Sunday. It could be the first or the last day of the week. It could be on the weekend. My sin, the wages is still death. It could be a holiday or it could be a holy day. It doesn't matter. Sin is sin is sin. From a believer's life and from an unbeliever's life. That's the reason that the message of the cross that we preach is so crucial. That's why it's so important that it be understood because of that fact that the wages of sin is death no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you are in life. That's the reason. There's only one way. There is only one way to address sin. There is only one way. That's the interesting thing about it. When you have a sickness, when you have a virus, if you have a disease, if you're infected, if it's bacterial, if it's fungal, there's a variety of different ways to treat that. But when it comes to sin, there's all kinds of varieties of sin, but there's only one way to treat it. That's right. And that's through the blood of Christ. We know, we know. We know that we have to put our faith in what he did at the cross. The world has a way of putting a spin and a twist on just about any and everything. Have you noticed how the world renames sin? It's interesting how they do that. However many sins the world can grab a hold of and try to rename it, God's attitude stays the same. His attitude towards sin remains. You're not supposed to talk about God on the job, by the way. That's how the world kind of renamed that. You know, Don't call sin a sinful lifestyle because you're not being politically correct, of course. It's a PC culture, right? I'm sure you've heard that. How about pride? What do they call pride? They call pride self-esteem. They call it self-worth. Another way to explain away pride is I deserve it. I worked hard for it. I had it coming to me. <laughs> Disobedience is just making a mistake. Or how about this? Having a bad day. That's what disobedience is to them. But the fact of the matter is Isaiah 5.20, he says, Woe to them that call evil good and call good evil. God's attitude remains the same. Fortunately, he looks right through it. He sees right through it. God knows the heart and God sees what the world's doing. And it's up to us to stay separated, to stay separated from all that, from all that nonsense. 1 John 2.2, 2, it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is. It says he is. It didn't say he was. See, we're saved people that he's talking to. And there he's, he's speaking to people in the church. He said he is the propitiation. He's saying now, today, currently, in your walk, where you are today as a believer, he still is the propitiation, the atonement. He is the salvation for your sins. Amen? Amen? He is. And not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Even now, even now, that's our sanctification. That's what keeps us. That's what keeps us. There must be atonement, I can't stress it enough, for all sin. 1 John 1, 9. Now this is really important right here because there is a message out there that I, I, I disagree with it. And what's being taught, it's a real big emphasis on grace. And, and, and grace is to be emphasized. I'm not against that. But they're saying that just because you sin doesn't mean you have to confess it every single time. If it's a known sin that you are aware of, that is wrong. You need to confess it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins. What puts emphasis on this is if. If if was not in that verse, then maybe, and I'm saying maybe, there could be a little bit of debate there. But because if is there, there is no debate on that matter. Right. If we confess our sins, 
then, I put in a little then there, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Unconfessed sin, I say to you today, is unforgiven sin. Simply put, we've got to be very clear about our doctrine. We have to be very clear. And the only way that it's going to be right is if we stay true to every single word that we have in that Bible that we call the Word of God. While the world is busy blurring the lines, God is preparing a wrath and a judgment of which the recipients of that wrath can never return. Numbers 32, verse 23 says, Behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Now, I didn't have time to go and just read that whole story. So what I did was I just took that one little verse. And I'm going to make sure we're not taking it out of context. Of course, I did not. I went back and I read the story to make sure. And what was happening then is Israel, in their journey in the wilderness, you know, they were supposed to be going to a promised land. God had already told them when they left, before they left Egypt, that he was going to take them and give them their own land. He told Moses. He told Abraham. He told Abraham. And so what was going on is that they were traveling in the wilderness and they had gotten to that point. They had gotten to where they were at the Jordan River. They were going to cross over. They were going to go into Canaan. They were going to whoop some tail and they were going to take their land. And so two of the tribes of Israel decided that they wanted to stay on this side of the Jordan because they were shepherds and they had lots of cattle, a lot of sheep. And so the, the land on this side of the Jordan was very green and it was very good. And they wanted to have their sheep grazed there. It was the lands of Jazer and Gilead. They, that was the lands that they wanted to stay on. And it was the tribes of Reuben and Gad. And for some reason, they wanted to stay there. An obvious reason, because those lands were just really, really beautiful, very rich to feed uh, their, their sheep and all their cattle. And so that was the draw. That was the reason. It was close to the Jordan. It would be very close to where the new, the, the upcoming Israel was going to be. And Moses started to, to preach at him. He started to say, well, look, you know, the first time we came up this route, we sent in Joshua, Caleb, and the other 10 spies. They went in, they scouted out the land, they checked it out. And there were some repercussions for the 10 that came back with a bad report. And here we are again. And now you're wanting to stay on this side. And, and so I'm reading the story and I'm like, okay, is this Moses, Moses? Or is this Moses from God, Moses? You know, is this just Moses being Moses because he's got a temper? Because everybody knows if you know very much about Moses, he has a tendency to fly off the handle. and doesn't have a whole lot of patience in certain situations. I'm not 100% sure at this point. But because what ends up happening is Moses, and I'm, I'm taking it that it was by the direction of God. It didn't exactly say, but Moses said, okay, all right. I preached at you. I gave you the warning. And in fact, they even stepped in and they said, look, we'll go with you across Jordan. We'll fight. Because Moses was getting on him about trying to get out of fighting. He was like, oh, so y'all want to just hang out over here in this beautiful rich land while the rest of us go over there with swords in our hands to fight a really, really tough battle against these giants that are in the land. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to go. We're all willing. We will go in. We will go with you. We will fight. We will fight. In fact, we will not possess that land until we go in and we fight with you. And Moses said, all right, I hope you understand what you're saying. You're not going to possess that land. You're not going to have it until you come in with us and we finish off Canaan and we get the land that God promised us. And they said, that's it. And so that's what led up to this verse. Behold, you have sinned against. He's giving them the warning. He's not saying that you did sin. He's saying, if you end up doing it, I'm going to tell you, behold, you have sinned. And be sure your sin will find you out. If you do that thing, you make a vow to God. You say, I'm doing it, God. This is it. God's holding you to your word. It's a very, very weighty matter to go against your word and to not do it. Right. Romans 2, 5 through 11. 
It says, but after your hardness and impotent heart treasures up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. To them will be indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil. Of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. There were some Gentiles among them. And to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. Again, it's that cheap junk. It's wasted wages. And that's the result. There was something interesting. I started to have a conversation with a friend offshore. And he started, I don't know why we got on this, but we were, he was talking about hunting. And uh, while talking about hunting, he started to talk about hound dogs. And he said, Aaron, he said, let me tell you something about them hound dogs. He said, they are some really remarkable creatures. And he said, a lot of people don't realize just how amazing they are. And I don't know if y'all know, but there are so many different breeds of hounds. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, I don't know, I'm not, there's probably close to a hundred of them or more. There's a lot of different types of hound dogs. And he said, you can take a hound dog and you can train that dog to hunt anything on the planet. He said, it does not matter what it is, how ferocious the creature, this creature will hunt that creature. You just have to train it. Because what they do by nature is they hunt everything. And so you have to narrow them down to just hunt that one thing. He said, they'll hunt cougars. They'll hunt bears. He said, they'll hunt foxes, wolves. It doesn't matter what it is. They will hunt them. He said, I've got a friend. He said, and this friend, he had his hound dogs hunting after bears. And he's from Maine. He lives in Maine. And um, he said in Maine, you know, there is, a, there is a very short season for it. And he said, I, I didn't see it. He said, but my friend, he said, he told me the story about when they were hunting after this bear and they backed it into a corner. And I mean, they're just howling and howling and barking and barking. And, and that bear's swiping at him, swiping at him. And he said, one swipe, and he actually connected with, with the jaw of one of those dogs. And he said, the, the, just the force of that swipe, just, I mean, it unhinged the dog's jaw. And he said, that dog just kept on barking. Hur. I mean, it was a ridiculous bark, but that dog did not stop barking. It's just amazing how, how fierce these creatures are. And it's just the way God created them, the way he made them. With their, it's in their nature. It's just who they are. And the, the more I thought about that, I thought about the hounds of sin and how the power of the cross unhinges the power of sin. But regardless of that fact, the sin nature is still there, friend. Yeah. The sin nature just keeps on coming back. Have you noticed? <laughs> Have you noticed? And so I just want to give you encouragement because that bear, to me, represents the power of the cross. And the thing is, we have access. We have ongoing, daily, continuous, 24-7 access no matter what time zone you live on, what country you live in, he's always on call Hallelujah. to every person. And what he does is when you turn to him, he has the power to slap the dog out of that dog, that <laughs> hound of sin, whatever that thing that's hounding after you. And he can unhinge it. Oh, it still barks, but it's ineffective. It's ineffective at the feet of the cross. There's all kinds of different hound dogs, I told you, but I mean, you've got sight and you've got scent hound dogs. And the sight hound dogs are the ones that are really swift. They're fast, amazing, like a, a greyhound. They say a greyhound can run up to 40 miles an hour. I mean, that's just crazy to me. A whippet. You know, they've got other really, and those are the taller ones. They're the ones that are slender. And uh, the ears are shorter. The, I don't, snout. 
yet the snout is not so big, you know, it's more slender. And they're just like a bullet, I mean like a rocket. When they see what they're hunting and they just shoot, and I mean they take off, if it's a cougar, they don't care. They don't care, that's just what's, what's amazing to me. And so that's what a sight hound is more like, but then you've got other hound dogs that are more of the scent hound, and they just simply train them to pick up that particular scent. And of course, there are some that are just more naturally, they're going to gravitate toward a particular scent. You've got blue tick dogs and you've got uh, walker dogs, walker hounds. The walker hound is the one that got his jaw unhinged. And they tend to be fast for a scent dog, but nothing like 40 miles an hour because they, you know, they've got the long ears, they've got the big snout, the big nose, the big mouth. And so a bloodhound, it's really interesting about the bloodhound. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that one. Because the bloodhound has physical characteristics that account for its ability to follow a scent trail that's been left behind for several days. Under normal conditions, a bloodhound can detect as few as one or two cells. That's crazy to me. One or two cells. The bloodhound's nasal chambers are larger than most of most other breeds. The olfactory bulb in dogs is roughly 40 times bigger than the olfactory bulb in humans relative to total brain size. And 125 to 220 million olfactory receptors. And so that's just an area in the brain that actually is responsible for all of our scent and those, that sense related to that. In some dog breeds, such as bloodhounds, the olfactory senses has nearly 300 million receptors. The large, long, pendant ears serve to prevent wind from scattering nearby skin cells while the dog's nose is on the ground. God is so awesome. The folds of wrinkled flesh under the lips and neck called the shawl serve to catch stray scent particles in the air or on a nearby branch as the bloodhound is scenting, reinforcing the scent in the dog's memory and nose. However, not all agree that the long ears and loose skin are functional, some regarding them as a handicap. Whatever the case, whatever the case, there is another story that I did uh, hear from another friend, I'm sure. Um, there was a 12-year-old boy that had been dead and he had been missing for seven days and somehow they, they got that bloodhound to have his scent and it took seven days. <laughs> Think about that. It took seven days and that dog went right up to an apartment building, right up to the very door that boy was behind that door in that house, in that apartment and found him. There are so many accounts of bloodhounds following trails for many, many hours. The record was a family, a whole family that was found dead in Oregon in 1954, over 330 hours after they had gone missing, they were found by a bloodhound. Again, I can't stress it enough how the sin nature is. You may feel like you have control, you might feel like it's all good, and maybe it is, um, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not. But don't underestimate the sin nature. Don't think that, that, that we can ignore it. Don't think, because like a dead corpse that you push underwater, it's going to push right back up to the surface. And it's going to come back. And so the fact of the matter is it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when I'm going to have to address that sin nature. And in fact, why wait for it to flare up? You know, why not just spend time at the cross daily? Why not just go to Christ and go and appeal to his strength and appeal to his grace daily? I mean, that's what he said in Luke, right? He said, take up your cross daily, deny yourself, follow after me. The good news is that the gift keeps on giving. This is the third point. The last point. The gift keeps on giving if we keep on believing. And it's exactly like that. Amen. The wages of sin 
the wasted wages of sin is death, but the good gift of God is eternal life. Romans 1, 16 through 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. It's the miraculous power. When you look up that word power, in the Greek it means miraculous power. It means force. May the force be with all of you. May the force of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is righteousness, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Have you ever looked at that part right there where it says that therein, he's talking about the gospel and the power. He says therein, the righteousness of God is revealed. But this is the part that I used to wonder about. From faith to faith. What does that mean? Notice he didn't say from faith to works. Think about that. <coughs> Think about that. From faith to faith. The only way for it to get done, the job is already done on God's end, but the only way for the job to get done on our end is faith. It's not a physical activity. It's not something that we do in a tedious way. It's, it's just simply maintaining and holding an anchor of faith in what He has done for us there. That is what breaks the band and the power of sin. It breaks the back of sin. He said, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The word revealed means to take off the cover. Something that was veiled, now it is uncovered. To lay it open. To lay open what has been veiled or covered up. What was covered under the old covenant. What was covered for Moses and Abraham and all of them. Don't get me wrong. The just shall live by faith is something that was first said in Habakkuk. Habakkuk said it. It was an Old Testament verse of scripture that was being quoted. I, I'm realizing more and more now that a lot of these New Testament scriptures are just simply citations. They're citing the Old Testament prophets, they're, they're quoting Moses and Abraham and all these patriarchs. What's interesting there, what's interesting there is that although they had the animal sacrifices to fall upon, and it did get the job done, it did, Abel. Was, was a good example that it does get the job done. It pleases God. It pleased God. But there was still something different. There was still that cover. There was still that veil. There was still that restriction there that was not the same. They had to do so much. There were so much, so many works that they had to do, that they had to perform to make sure that that sacrifice that they were depending on, that they were relying on, would be made. Whereas with us, 100% of the work for that sacrifice was done in the sacrifice himself. He did it all. 100%. He did it. He performed it. He was the sacrifice. In a sense, you could say he performed the sacrifice. Because he could have called the angels down to come and take him off the cross. Why did he have to call the angels down if that would have happened? Because he was functioning and operating as a man. Remember, he took his own deity and he put it to the side. That's he right. stepped aside from his own deity. Right. Faith to faith. It is not from faith to works, but faith to faith. Faith in his sacrifice has placed us all into a justified state. And faith it is. That is what will keep us. It will keep us in his sacrifice. Not works. Along the path and all the way to the end of our natural life, it will always be a matter of faith. From faith to faith, from justification to sanctification, it is faith pressing forward, as in fighting the good fight of faith. It's faith pressing forward, gaining ground over doubt. It's faith pressing forward, gaining ground over doubt. It's faith pressing forward and gaining ground over over doubt. What I'm saying today is that sin and the sin nature, as big and huge and, and mountainous of a problem as it is, I find that doubt 
is right there. I mean, it, doubt, just plain, pure, 100% simple doubt. I know what's going on with Rand. I, I understand the little bit that's been told to me. But I'm going to tell you what, if we can just put doubt aside and take some time to continue to pray for that situation, we're going to be amazed. We're going to be amazed at what God can do. Amen. God's not going to disappoint us. I believe it. Gaining ground, faith pressing forward, gaining ground over doubt and maintaining the victory. Maintaining that sanctification. Maintaining the victory over unbelief. Victory over the sin nature. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we're talking communion right here, you do show the Lord's death till He comes. Now this is interesting. I really, really wasn't planning on using this until the very last minute. Until I did see this, because me and my wife decided to take communion today. You ought to do that sometime. Take communion in your home. And then go into prayer. You might be surprised at what happens after that. That's, it's really remarkable. It's really amazing. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. Who is He talking to here? Again. He's talking to believers. Who is qualified to take communion? Believers. He's saying, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. How is it possible? Looking at this right here, how is it possible that we can put aside the cross and move on in our relationship with Christ? How is it possible that we can continue in our faith in Christ and put the cross behind us? You know there's people that teach that. There's people that preach that, that we need to move on from the cross. The elementary and beggarly things, which is totally out of context for that scripture that talks about putting aside the elementary and the beggarly things. But what's interesting is that the word show means to declare, to, to preach, to teach, to proclaim and openly, to proclaim publicly and openly, excuse me, to proclaim publicly and openly. Every time that we do take communion, what we are doing is we are showing, we are proclaiming, we're teaching, we're openly and publicly proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. Because we are not ever to graduate away from that. We're never to move away from His death. Never. Never. It doesn't matter what anybody says, what they show you in the Bible. It doesn't matter what they show you in Scripture. In proper context, there's no possible way that we are ever going to be instructed by God or His apostles to move away from the cross. In fact, he's encouraging them not to. What he's saying is what you need to do is you need to get bogged down in something. And the very thing that you need to get bogged down into is the death of Jesus Christ. Because what he said in Romans chapter 1, 16, is that that's where the power is. It's in the proclamation of that. That's where the power is. So we need to get bogged down in it. We need to get stuck in it and stuck on it Amen. to where... There's really not a whole lot else to talk about outside of that. We can talk about some things outside of that, but it all seems to come right back to the cross. I remember when Matt was going through what happened, the, the big thing that happened in his life that helped to lead him to a, a closer, tighter walk with God, the revelation you know, that God gave him. He was saying it all the time, all the time. It was, it was really awesome. He was always saying, well, you know, man, it just goes back to the cross. Before he even fully understood the message like he knows it now, he would always say, it just, it all goes back to the cross. I mean, really, that right there is, is really, man, it's, it's very true. So believers are to take communion, not unbelievers. Why proclaim this to believers? Because, why? Because the hounds of sin. Because of the hounds of sin, because of that bloodhound of sin, it's there. It's there. Whether it's moving like a greyhound or it's moving like a bloodhound, 
that bad boy is going to catch up to you eventually. And we have got to stay close to the cross. We've got to stay very close. Yeah. Colossians 1.23. If you continue, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. The gospel must be preached. The gospel must be preached. I used to, I'm just speaking for me. I used to be very worried about what men were going to say behind my back when I would talk to them about Jesus. And then something changed. Something changed. Something very significant changed in my life. And I'm going to tell you what. It didn't change until I started to ask for some help. It didn't change until I started to ask God to help me deal with the shame of my nakedness. To deal with the pride that I carried. The, the, the so-called image that I wanted to maintain and uphold. And why I wanted to uphold it and maintain it, it's probably not really that hard to figure out. Now I'm more concerned about what Jesus is going to say to me face to face. Yes. When you get to that place and, and, you know, and you connect, you connect, connect with the cross and, and that way. And, and he starts to, to just make you feel the guilt and shame. And then in the same instance, it melts and it just it starts to shed off of you. And you just start to realize this is not a message of condemnation at all. This is a message of victory. This is a message of overcoming. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You know, I was, I was witnessing to my uh, chiropractor. And uh, she, she had gone through something very recently. And, and she's, a, she's, a, she's a, a follower. She's a believer. And she had gone through something very serious in her personal life. And, and man, I could tell she, it was just really bringing her through the ringer. And I was preaching the message. I mean, I had to give her the truth. I gave her the message of the cross. I said, you know, it doesn't matter. I, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the cross you're on. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. I know you're saved. I told her that. I said, I know you're saved. I, I know. But you got to get back to the cross. If you're going to get victory, you've got to get back to the cross. You've got to. And then later on, she said, yeah, but you know, I hear what you're saying. But you know, the scripture says... And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Now, now think about this. The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And when she said that, I said, so what is their testimony anyway? Think about that. Gotcha. <laughs> and she just rolled right through it. Yeah, I mean, she, she kept rolling. She kept rolling through it, but... I'm telling you, if you look at the context of God's word, it's all there, y'all. It's, it's all there. And why we didn't see it before, I don't know. You know, I mean, I preach so many messages out of context. It's ridiculous. And thank God for his mercy. If you would stand with me, if, if thank God for his grace, thank God for his forgiveness, because that's something that even back then I took it very seriously, but I just didn't quite realize what I was doing. It's wasted wages. The wasted wages of sin is what's leading people on that road of eventual and def definite death. Those that they have just set their nose and they've set their face like a flint toward doing their own way. It's going to happen. And that's the reason why there's such an urgency in us even though we're saved, I, I heard someone that that's very close, very close to me. And she said, <laughs> we were talking about just people that are not living for God. And I couldn't believe it came out of her mouth. She said, well, she said, I know I'm saved and my family's saved. And that was the end of the statement. Like I was like, okay, and what's coming up next? <laughs> you know, there's got to be more to say after that. No, that was it. The end. That was the period right there. And I was just like dumbfounded. I didn't know what to say. I was, I was disarmed right there because I didn't expect it to come from her. But it did come from her. I was like, okay, that's the wrong attitude, y'all. That's the wrong attitude. That's not, that's not where we're supposed to be. And, and if that's where you are and that's just 
you know, just the simple truth. That's how you feel. You need to be honest. And, and we need to go to God and we just need to ask Him, God, change me. Put that burden in my heart. Put that burden in my heart for my family. I'm going to tell you something that does help. What does help is being baptized in the Holy Ghost. I know this for a fact. <laughs> I know this for a fact. I am 100% sure that being baptized in the Holy Ghost, whether you speak in tongues, whether you prophesy, whether you have the gift of discernment, whatever gift of the Holy Spirit you function in, being baptized in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, it does help. You don't have to understand it fully to get that. You just simply have to believe the same way that you became a saved person. The same way that God saves us through faith is the same way that you can receive any gift of the Holy Spirit. And something that just really reiterated the gift of the Holy Spirit in, in my life is because somebody received that gift behind my back while I was offshore. <laughs> like a ninja. <laughs> like a ninja. Like, <laughs> got it. And the thing, what's interesting is, is we haven't been married very long, but as long as we have been married, I, haven't, I don't think we've talked about it not once. Not once. Jesus baptized her. There was no man that had to lay his hands on her. It's nothing like that. The Bible says Jesus is the Holy Ghost baptizer. He's the one who does the baptizing. And that's who baptized her that day. And I just thought it was awesome because I didn't preach it to her. I didn't teach it to her. I didn't explain it to her. I didn't do anything. We never had a conversation. But, man, when God was ready. And I'm going to tell you what. There's another thing about my wife that you may not realize. She was bold before she got baptized in the Holy Spirit. She was sharing the gospel. She was talking to people. But, man, when she got baptized, <laughs> multiply that times 10. I'm telling you, the boldness. I mean, it just flew through the roof. And it's remarkable. It's amazing. It's, it's powerful. And that's what he said would happen. Look, I, I, know, I know that uh, I know there's, there's a lot of gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I know there's the belief that the evidence is you'll speak in tongues. And I don't preach against that. I don't teach against that. But one thing that I know that the Bible does say will happen every time every time, is you will be my witnesses. That's right. That's the only thing in Scripture where he says this will happen when the Holy Ghost comes on. No, he said this. He said, this is, guys, everybody wants your attention. This is what's going to happen. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's what I see. That's what I see. That's what I see. And what it's done to our prayer life, oh, wow, it's amazing. It's remarkable. It's, what it's doing is God's using that to bring things out in my walk that I didn't know was there. It was lying dormant. It's amazing. It's really remarkable. <clears throat>